What's up, everybody, and welcome back. I've got some looky-loos over there right now that are, I know they're going to cause trouble. Stay on your side of the fence. <sighs> Today we're going to be jumping into manufactured labeled rates, industry rates for fertilizers, and perhaps some surprises from a study that was done last summer. So we're going to get into some cool little details, maybe expose a couple of things, and hopefully give you a little bit more information about when you're making choices for certain things in your lawn. Let's go ahead and roll that intro. Okay, so first off, I'd like to say thank you to everybody who commented on the last video when I asked about grass type and area of the country that you are in. That actually really, really helped me to see kind of the audience that's out there and how I can gear uh, some of this content towards you all. So I can say, hands down, the cool season folks dominated that feed. I'm sorry for you warm season people out there. That's just the way that it is. Sometimes it sucks coming in second place. So I thought, what better way to really treat those people, uh, this mass audience out there of cool season folks by talking about warm season grass today. Yeah, I know, that's a little bit frustrating, but you'll have your turn, don't worry. So before we get too far into this video, I wanna make sure that you guys are subscribed. Make sure you do that. Click the like button. If you have questions, leave a comment. If you just have a comment, you can leave a comment. Or if you have a comment, you can leave a question. Or if you have a question, you can leave a comment. I don't really know which way that's supposed to go. Make sure you do it. I'll make sure that I get that answered for you and we can kind of continue this conversation as we go. Like it, subscribe it, share it, do all that fun stuff. Back at it. So for all you Bermuda folks out there that are watching this channel, this is something that I think that you're really going to get a kick out of. Now for everybody else, especially for you uh, tall fescue folks, people who did overseeding last year, uh, who are coming into the new season not knowing exactly if they got full coverage and maybe you're looking at maybe having to patch some things or you might have to do a little bit more seeding. All of this is going to tie into today's video and I think that everyone is going to come away with some pretty interesting information. So last year we took place in an establishment study that was done at UGA that was basically sprigging uh, Bermuda and growing it in and testing different starter fertilizers in kind of a wide spectrum to see what gave the best results and the quickest grow in. For the most part today, I'm going to focus on two of those and talk about the rates that were applied and how it sort of came about on overall results between two different granular fertilizers. So the two things that we're going to focus on today are going to be the bag rates listed on the fertilizer and then basically the industry suggested rates for doing this particular activity of sprigging and establishing Bermuda grass. Here's how this is going to apply to the rest of you out there who might be seeding or overseeding. This has to do mainly with starter fertilizer and getting the right amount of nutrient out there and making sure that you're going to get the best stand possible. All of this will tie together, so let's keep moving. So there were two different granular fertilizers that were used on this particular study and they were utilized at the bag rate suggested for a starter fertilizer. Now, if you start doing a little bit of research, you'll find out that uh, if you're trying to establish Bermuda, typically you want to put about 30 pounds of in down and then as the grass begins to grow and runners begin to form, you put down about another 50 pounds of in. Now that's per acre. So a total of 80 pounds of in, probably within the first, say, 40 days kind of right in that range and maybe even a little bit less. So 30 to start and then another 50 once the grass starts to run. Now in this particular study, the two granular fertilizers that were used, one was a 24-25-4 and the other one was a 10-18-10. At the rate suggested on the 24-25-4, that gives about 0.72 pounds of N, 0.75 pounds of P and a very nominal amount of K. So on the manufacturer's labeled rate on the 10-18-10, you come out with 0.32 pounds of N, 0.58 pounds of P, and 0.32 pounds of K. So those two have very different analysis and very different suggested label rates. Now, the phosphorus on those two come close to each other, but not quite. We're still off by about almost a fifth of a pound between the two. So obviously one of those has much higher rates than the other 
at the manufacturer's suggested rate. So if you do the math on that, you're basically going to see that the first bag is running right along what the industry would state as the suggested amount that you should put out, roughly that 30 pounds or close to three quarters of a pound of N. The phosphorus in there is typically needed for starter fertilizers. That's usually the time that people apply FOSS is when they're trying to do any sort of seeding or overseeding or establishment. That tends to be the most common where you're going to put the most out at any single time. So both of these fertilizers are labeled as starter fertilizers and they are designed to get grass moving fairly quickly. So over the course of the study, there were a couple of different things that came through where you could see how the grass was progressing. Uh, starting from a 35% coverage with the sprigging and then basically moving until the turf hit 100%. Now for the control, that took somewhere around eight weeks, nine weeks before it actually got to uh, full coverage in a couple of the test plots. Each one had four spots where it was tested at different rates. That one got to about 88%, one of them filled into 100%. But the goal here is to get it to 100% the quickest. So on the 24-25-4, on those four test plots, two of them hit 100% in 42 days. Two of those other test plots hit 80% in 42 days for basically a 90% completion if you were to average it out, which is truly going to be the best way to look at it because you're going to have a wide range of conditions. So in 42 days, had about 90% coverage. Now compare that to the other the 101810, which was put out at the rate suggested by the manufacturer, and again, much lower than what the industry rate would say, that one only had one of the test plots that were done end up at 100%, and the other ones, not quite so good. 60%, 76%, and 84% for a combined total of 80% coverage. Now, here's the very interesting part about that. Both of those fertilizers are widely available, uh, both from very reputable companies with tons and tons of turf history and knowledge, so I would say that they should have a pretty good dial down on what they have seen as the most effective, which is why those rates were mentioned on the bag, kind of like mm, sort of the fail safe zone. Now for many people over a course of six weeks, they might be okay with an 80% average coverage, possibly. For others, myself included, I wanna get a maximum amount of coverage the fastest possible because I don't wanna have any bare dirt showing so that I don't have to deal with any weeds or have to do any excessive work to try to make the lawn look better, we just want that grass to grow in faster. So between the two of these, they basically came in right around the same price if you purchase them both locally. The 24254 runs about $4 per thousand at their bag rate. Uh, the other, the 101810, runs about $4 and a penny per thousand at bag rate bought over the shelf. Both of those could be shipped to your door at about a buck 80 a thousand to make up for that. So why was there such a disparity between the two? For the most part, there is a standard in the way of doing things. And like I mentioned at the beginning of the video, running about 30 pounds of nitrogen per acre to get your Bermuda established uh, right after sprigging is probably going to be the most common way. So one of them definitely came in a lot lower, which basically would have been around, oh, figure 12 to 15 pounds max is basically how much nitrogen went out. So about half of what it really needed to put out there. But is that really enough? Is that enough to say, the only reason that it didn't perform as well is because there wasn't enough nutrient put down. Probably so. I would, uh, I would definitely go with that theory, but then I would have to run the math on that and say, well, there's no reason to apply that particular fertilizer because if I had to put it out at twice the rate that's on there, it would be ridiculously expensive, running $8 a thousand to get that down onto the ground for over-the-counter purchased at a store price. If I had it shipped to me, now I'm running almost $12 a thousand for that particular material and having to put it down just gobs more than something that was way cheaper that obviously got a better result. But does it truly all come down to that simple of agronomic math? Does it have to be this 0.72 rate? Is that really what we need to have on there? Maybe. But let's look at one other thing. So as I mentioned before, we actually ran a couple of other liquids on there as well. Uh, some of mine, some of another company, and we're gonna do another video on the whole liquid side of it first. But this is just to put your thinking caps on so you can kind of get an idea of what might be a good route to go for 
the springtime if you're looking to try to fill in your turf a little bit faster. So we ran our Green Pop 1621-2 out there against these other granular fertilizers, again, running at manufacturer's rate. One of them we ran with an additional three ounce rate of RGS and one we just ran straight through, just to try to get an idea of what we were seeing for boosting. And again, there's another couple videos worth of content just based on that statement I just made. So at the rates that we went out with the 1621-2, we basically came out with a 0.24 pounds of N, 0.3 pounds of P, and very nominal K. So low amounts of potassium, pretty much on everything except that 10-18-10. And not as much N, obviously, as the 10-18-10, and nowhere near as much as the 24-25-4. So running the green pop out there, on our four different trials, we had four different measurements that came through. One at 84%, one at 92%, one at 80%, and one at 100%. So essentially we came in at 89% total right there behind the 24-25-4. Now the 24-25-4 had three times the amount of nutrient in it than we were applying with this liquid, and yet we came in very close within a margin of error on that particular trial. But if we bump out and look what happened when we threw the RGS in there, it changed the story completely. And I'll get to pricing on this in a second. So with a three ounce rate of RGS added on top of the 1621-2, the story changed dramatically. Two of the test plots hit 100%, one hit 88, and the other hit 84%. On that particular trial, we ended up with a 93% total coverage rate, again, running about a third of the nutrients as what would be typically suggested by industry standard. But what about cost? It sounds like we had to add in a bunch of stuff and that was probably going to make it more expensive. Well, not really. If you watch some of those other videos, you know what the rate of green pop comes out to and it's somewhere around $3.20 a thousand. If we have to throw in that RGS, that maybe bumps up to like $3.60, $3.65 a thousand, which still places it squarely underneath bagged fertilizer on the shelf and provides a better result. So here's the point of all this. It's pretty simple to get to bickering about the rates of N, the rates of P, the rates of K that turf absolutely needs in order to grow in or thrive or survive or however you want to put it. There is tons of information out there about running certain amounts of pounds of nutrients all the time. But then sometimes there's information that comes along that sort of advances those steps and moves us into a new century saying, perhaps there's other ways to facilitate growth and encourage plant growth and encourage plant establishment that doesn't require pounding the ground with excessive nutrients in order to get the same result. So there's a couple of key takeaways on that if you really just start to drill into the numbers as a whole. Number one, why spend money on things that aren't doing you any good? If you're gonna throw something down, you wanna make sure that you're getting the best bang for the buck. That's one of the most important pieces of any fertilizer program, whether you are professional or DIYer, You've got to know what things are costing and you don't want to be throwing money away. If that isn't enough for you, there's number two. And this is the one that is actually more important to me. In my career, what I've been trying to show people is that you can grow extremely healthy turf with way less inputs. And it's just by working a little bit more with the biology. That's really it. And when I say biology, I kind of mean everything here. I'm not just talking about microbiology. I am talking about working with the plant, working with the soil, working with all of it as one cohesive unit. So I'm going to be continuing to put out videos in this manner over the next little while because there is a lot of data from these studies that have gone on that needs to be shared and that people need to get a better understanding of so they can make the right choices, especially as we come into springtime and you do have maybe some thin spots and you do have areas that you need to grow in. So you're not out there panicking and just throwing stuff down for the hell of it. You actually have a good plan and goal and you can put out the material that you know is going to make the biggest impact. So I hope this helped with that. It looks like I bored my audience, so I'm gonna go. I'll talk to you guys real soon. See ya. Stay on your side of the fence. <sighs> Park City Pestilence.